Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We are so happy to be together, and I am happy, thrilled to be here with some of my closest friends, um, some extraordinary rabbis to teach this afternoon of Shabbat HaGadol, when it's traditional for rabbis to speak um, for a tremendous amount of time on Shabbat afternoon and tire everybody out, but get them excited and enthralled um, and enthusiastic about Pesach. And so we're um, we're really excited to be able to be here together today. One of the things that we were just remarking about uh, when we were speaking together is that while there are so many challenges in this time, being away from each other and not being able to be together and sing together and hold each other and comfort each other in real life, the um, opportunity to be with people who are very far away and bring Torah together um, because we can't be with anybody who's close um, is an opportunity that we're all trying to seize. So it's uh, even in this time that's really, really challenging and really heartbreaking in so many ways. Um, being able to connect with the silver linings, I think, is so critical and important. Um, so thank you all for being here today. I want to um, just introduce my friends and colleagues who are here. And we thought we'd go around and begin by uh, introducing ourselves and just saying um, a few words about how we prepare for Pesach and what makes us feel most prepared and maybe even particularly about what is making us feel prepared for Pesach this year. So um, with me today um, is Rabbi Amanda Schwartz, Rabbi Carrie Benveniste, and Rabbi Lori Matzkin. Rabbi Amanda Schwartz is from here in Denver and Rabbi Carrie Benveniste uh, lives in Manhattan Beach and uh, uh, just south of Los Angeles in California and Rabbi Lori Matzkin lives in Northern California. And uh, Rabbi Matzkin and Rabbi Benveniste and I were in school together and uh, um, spent men much time studying and learning together in school. And it's just been such a thrill to get to uh, learn um, and become friends with Rabbi Schwartz since I've been here. So um, without uh, further ado, if you guys want to uh, share a few words about yourselves, that would be really wonderful. Who wants to go first? I'm happy to go. Um, Hi, I am Rabbi Amanda Schwartz. I work for an organization in Denver called Judaism Your Way, and uh, I'm very excited to be with you all this afternoon. Oh, should I also answer the question about getting ready for Pizza? Yeah. Um, so I usually get ready for Passover um, by frantically cleaning my house and moving everything around and um, and I'm doing that a little bit this year, but I feel like um, everything is very different this year and I have a different bandwidth um, for that type of physical preparation. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about, um, there's a ceremony when you've cleaned all of the hametz or puffed up food out of your house. It's called Bior Hametz when we burn up the um, yummy puffy food. And, um, after, um, during this, we recite basically that um, all the hummus in my possession, which I haven't removed or that I'm unaware of, um, it's as if it's the dust of the earth. So it's this moment of kind of letting go of saying I've done my best. Um, and that's what I'm really holding on to this year is I'm doing my best right now. Thank you. Thank you. Lori, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, yes, I appreciate that so much. Um, I'll just add to what Amanda said um, that I feel a, a sadness, a grief, a frustration that I'm I actually don't think we're going to even get out our Passover uh, crate at all. We're just going to switch to, you know, doing things in the house that we have. There's just not the ability to totally go through our, my normal process um, with my three and five year old at home as well all the time. Um, but what I am holding on to for my preparation is the idea of the story, the foundational story of leaving Egypt, the story from the Torah, um, moving through in a rush to get out. That's how I felt the day that California had shelter in place many weeks ago now, and the sense of both scarcity and trying to get through uh, a narrow place and get through the Tsar, the middle, the Tsaurus of, uh, of Egypt and go through the sea um, and maybe letting go even of the idea of the Haggadah of extra rituals and extra narratives and try to go back to that feeling of, of leaving Egypt and finding expansiveness. Mm. 
That's beautiful. So I just got a notification that we may be, oh, okay. I got a notification that there may not be any sound, um, but apparently there actually is sound. So that's good. I'm glad that that, um, that our, whoever is out there has at least been able to hear those beautiful teachings. Thank you. Carrie, do you want to share as well? Uh, I'm I'm Carrie Benvenisti. I am a rabbi educator in a really fun, small or medium-sized community in Southern California. And I usually spend a lot of time teaching or helping teachers teach students about Passover and why we do it, how we do it. And um, I'm stuck home like everybody else. And I have teenage children. And so I have been defaulting to my favorite, not rabbi activity, which is crafting and creating and sewing. And I have been spending a lot of time uh, kind of creating and thinking about how to make it fun for my kids when it's going to be just the three of us. On yeah. Yeah. It's like a huge, a huge shift if you're used to having really big seders to go to just having a small intimate seder, but maybe there's some beauty that comes out of that as well. Being with my kids. You're right. Exactly. Um, so I think I would answer that um, by actually the, my own question by saying that um, just being able to be here with you guys today, I think is really a nice way to prepare. I think sometimes thinking about pieces of the story and thinking about pieces of the Haggadah and thinking about um, aspects of the Seder that speak to me each year and really pulling them out and figuring out what um, like what ultimately will be my focus point for my heart in each year. Um, enables me to feel a little bit more prepared for taking it all on. Uh, certainly, like, costuring the kitchen and push, pulling all my stuff out, like, that does too. But in truth, um, that's also not, I wouldn't say tremendously a fun experience that comes with this holiday, but I think certainly one that makes me feel like I'm in it, like, very physically in it. Um, but I think that the act of studying and the act of learning, and particularly the act of... Um, Making Torah my own and learning the Torah that speaks to people who are dear to me is something that really, um, really resonates with me. So thanks again for being here. Thanks for inviting us. So um, we we thought that uh, Rabbi Carrie Benveniste um, would mm -hmm. begin. Uh, she's going to focus on some of the educational models of the Seder, and we're going to try to uh, have this be pretty informal, uh, informal conversation. So whereas Carrie will will begin the conversation, that may lead to some discussion as we as we continue to move through. Okay. Uh, so I'm happy to start. I am an education director. Um, I have always worked with kids and children from preschool now through 12th grade at my congregation and in my life uh, from the time I was a Girl Scout. And for me, um, I learned early that people learn in a different way. And Passover is an amazing invention. I mean, we Jews got it right so long ago when we created the Passover Seder, Seder and the Haggadah because it touches on all of the senses. It's taste, touch, hearing, smelling, um, all of the things that you need to really learn something. So we talk about educational models. Uh, there are, you know, some people are visual learners, some people are auditory learners, some people are tactile learners, and everybody needs all of these things to really learn something. And it, prevent, it presents us with a perfect experiential model. And by experiential, I mean the experience teaches you. You don't get lectured at and you learn, you experience it and you teach it. And so I, my best example of this is matzah. Matzah is dry and crumbly and disgusting and gross sometimes. And it's also delicious and yummy and it gets on everything. So if you're thinking about how is that a model for something, you, how is that a model for learning anything? Well, what do you taste when you taste matzah? What do you feel when it, the crumbs go down into your lap and stick between your thighs of your, you know, in your skirt or what does it sound like when you crunch it? All of that leads to the story. We're supposed to see ourselves as if we left Egypt. So in the sense of matzah, we are feeling, tasting, touching what it meant to like to be in the desert and to have to leave. Um, that's an experience, an experiential model of learning. And that's where I like to kick off anything I'm talking about with the Pesach and the Haggadah. Because if you open a Haggadah, it's sometimes a little scary, especially if you're at this for the first time and usually somebody else hosts or you don't host. I remember thinking there's so much Hebrew in here. What, what are we doing? There's so many pages. We have to read every single one. And the truth is, no, you have to 
pick and choose throughout the entire thing. What is meaningful to you? What experience do you want to have? What experience do you want to pass to your children? Um, do you want to feel them to feel loved and embraced? Do you want them to know what it feels like to be slaves? Make them work. <laughs> you know, I and so for me, the Haggadah is my favorite Jewish text of all time because it presents to you an outline, almost like a lesson plan um, for experiencing path. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's great. It yeah. reminds me um, of the piece. I remember learning the piece in the Gemara about how if you have children who come to the Seder and begin by asking lots of questions, are you, the question is, are you then obligated to still ask the four questions? And all of us know that if there was a Seder without the four questions, it would feel like we never had a Seder because like, how could you ever have a Seder without the four questions? It's sort of what is, you know, in some ways like the seminal part of the experience. But, um, but, but the truth is, is that the Gemara says you don't have to ask the four questions if uh, if other people are already asking questions because the whole idea of the Seder is to just, that's that's the idea of the questions, to enable the questioning to begin and to encourage people to ask questions. And so if everyone's already got that down, then those particular four questions maybe don't need to be asked. And I always think that that's such a great education model for um, just creating the notion of questions and answering and that questions are sometimes often like far more important than actually what the answers are. And many of us don't have the answers, but if we sure. are free to ask questions and free to be, um, to know that our questions, no question is a bad question. And think about what our society could really look like. Or there's no one answer to a question, which I think is what is genius about this. Um, you know, yeah. there's a lot of possible answers. There's a lot of possible creativity from any questions that you could come up with. I think right. that right. feels particularly timely right now too, when we're living in what feels like a new world and um, we all have so many questions and there may very well be many answers. Um, but right now I feel like we're really living in this world of questioning. And um, I, I, so I have two very small children. Um, so I'm not sure this would work for our Seder, but one thing I have thought about is like, could the Seder table be a place for people simply to kind of share their questions about the world we're living in right now. Yeah. I'll add to that, this idea of Yisrael, right? That the name, one of the names of the Jewish people is Israel, which means wrestling with God. And so to just add that permission on top of the questions for the joy of it, the questions that are painful, why is this happening? What are the systems that we've all been complicit in that has led to both the positive and the negative sides of globalization, just for an example. How did we get in a situation where essential has been so misconstrued that now we truly see who's essential in society? So to say that there's wrestling uh, with big questions, I think is another wonderful mm. piece that we can all give permission in the questioning. Mm. That's really great. Mm. great. Mandy, do you want to share your? Uh... Yeah. So, um, as you as you mentioned, um, we if you read through some rabbinic texts about the seder, we know we don't actually need to be asking the four questions. It's really like a setup for kids who don't know how to ask questions. You teach them to ask these questions. But similarly, for most of us, the seder would feel like we missed it if we didn't ask the four questions that are in the Haggadah. Um, and I was thinking about the, um, one of the four questions talks about um, reclining. Um, and I, I was just curious to start out, like what, what do you guys make of reclining? Is this something you do in your homes, in your seders? Um, I think in recent years, it's more so. Like in What's recent that? Years, it's become more of a thing to like, you know, have a pillow at the Seder and to certainly like, you know, when you're drinking your wine to recline to the left, which maybe looks like the right on this because it's kind of a mirror image on our screen. So if I re I'm now reclining to my right, but it looks like I'm reclining to my left. But that whole notion and, and also to, um, to pour wine for other people, right? Sort of fitting in with that like idea of reclining and helping people. 
I love this. Normally we have so many people at our house and we squeeze in tight. So reclining isn't really an option, except whenever we read the line for, you know, the recline to the left to drink your wine, the kids always get a kick out of like laying on top of each other and wiggling and giggling. And I love that aspect <laughs> because it's like um, that comfort you take in the closeness of other people. So it'll be interesting to see this year what happens. Mm. Yeah. What about you, Lori? Well, I'm thinking about how many of us are zooming from our beds or zooming. I not the chair, I'm oh, pajamas. But the original chair I was gonna uh, uh, be on this call from was the nursing chair, right? So, like, to be in this rocking chair and to be working, it's it's an interesting question of how do we show up and be present, especially as leaders and family leaders with the children, with those who don't know how to ask and also allow ourselves to be comfortable and allow, as you started with Amanda, all that work to pay off and to say, whatever it is, it is, I'm reclining into this moment. It might look different. It might be joyfully different mm -hmm. or frustratingly different, <sighs> but sort of rec reclining into the present moment. Yeah, I love that. I love that language of reclining into the present moment. That's beautiful. Um, so we know that this idea of reclining was kind of adopted by the Jewish community from what they'd seen in, in surrounding society of, of Romans um, participating in, in symposia. And it had sort of a status element that only people of a certain status um, could recline. And, and when you read the Mishnah, it starts out as very egalitarian saying that like everyone at the Seder has to recline. And then when you read further in the Gemara, it becomes less and less equal saying that um, women actually don't recline because they're not really free people, even if they're at the Seder. So I particularly love that it's for women right now um, leading this conversation. Um, but I was just thinking about kind of, I don't know how we eat normally in, in society and, and also kind of so hierarchies and um, I don't have this fully fleshed out, but I'm just thinking about how we might bring that into our seders this year. And um, I know that even over the past couple of weeks, as I've done more and more over over Zoom, and um, I've noticed like spending so much time in front of the computer, it's felt like actually physically really bad on my body. Um, and uh, just thinking about like, how might we change our posture at the Seder this year, whether that's like doing some stretching to uh, like relieve the, the computer kinks that have developed, or um, maybe it's not, if we've been spending a lot of time sitting, since this night is supposed to be about doing things differently, maybe like we should be standing at the Seder um, or maybe it should, you know, maybe if you don't have much time to relax in bed, maybe your Seder should be for your bed, from your bed. Um, we actually never got around to taking down our sukkah this year. I mean, the sach is down, but it's basically like a pergola in our backyard. And um, we're actually thinking of tying our, our Seder out in the, in our sach, <laughs> the sukkah, just as like a way of really making the night feel different. And um, I was curious to hear from you guys if there are ways you're thinking about whether it's like physical posture or where you're doing your Seder in your house about how to make it feel different this year. So it's funny that you asked that because just yesterday I was recalling the various Sedarim that I've been at where um, furniture was moved and everyone sat either on couches or even on the floor and um, sort of around a tablecloth that was on the floor and maybe even the meal itself was eaten at a dining room table but all of the all of the pieces before the meal um, were done really relaxed um, on a carpet and uh, I was thinking about that in my own home and thinking about oh well maybe we should really set like really set it up in the living room instead of in the dining room um, because maybe that really, that does bring it out more in a sense. Yeah, and I imagine you couldn't normally do that if you had 20 people at your house for a Seder okay. and this year you have room. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mary, you are muted. 
I've been keeping myself on mute because I'm a very noisy bird in the background. <laughs> I was love your question because I was actually thinking um, instead of doing it in another part of the house, which is what we usually do, you know, move the furniture and tables, like you said, I was thinking we should just do it at the kitchen table in the kitchen where it's nice and warm and cozy and just mm. up. And I was thinking how that would be so different than our usual running around and prepping and like getting out all the fancy tablecloths and the extra silverware and the extra leaves in the table. And I, that could be really fun. Yeah. And again, you probably, like you said, you wouldn't normally do it that way. So it's, uh, totally different. Yeah. I think what this brings for me is the idea of, uh, the days, the days passing, um, when we're at home and don't have normal rhythms, right? My husband and I are both educators. So the idea of spring break and, Passover being more home rather than the weeks before being in normal school routines. Um, we have been diligent about using our turquoise tablecloth for Shabbat and leaving it on instead of sort of cleaning up a little bit after Friday night, really leaving it on um, and through through bedtime through Havdalah on Saturday. And so uh, I I wonder if really the environment of the home. Uh, we can all, our viewers as well, think about what are some of the little changes that can signal difference in the days. Um, my son, who's just learned to write a little bit this year, he has a Sandra Boyton calendar on the wall um, and he X's off every day. And every day is a funny holiday. That's a real holiday. So recently it was ferret day or it might be banana day. And so that marking of the days, of course, usually we count up to Passover but without the change of being with grandparents or getting out the fine china, there might be ways that we could symbolize, you know, I don't know, a sticky a sticky pad with uh, brick drawings on it. What can we do to feel that that time morphing into Passover time? And then it's still exciting time, right? I just want to add that, like, we're all people who have children and that sort of idea that you want your kids, like we all want our kids, right, to have some excitement. It's piss off. And there's, you know, this is, you know, maybe we're excited about the matzah, maybe we dread the matzah, but it's an exciting holiday and a holiday that I think for many of us, we're also used to spending with a lot of people that not only we love, but our children love. And so how do we make a holiday then continue to feel special and continue to feel like a symbol of our freedom and our, you know, um, the whole, right? Like you said, Amanda, we lean because, you know, noble people lean and people are free leaned. And so it's uh, really appreciating what that freedom feels like in a time when we actually like aren't really totally free. I mean, we are much, much, much more free than many of our people were when they celebrated this holiday. It's for centuries and centuries, certainly no question. And um, thank God, um, thank goodness for that. But we also are living with some restraints right now, right? Like we can't really leave our houses um, and we can't be free to invite anybody we want to our sedarim. And um, and so there are, there are some constraints on our freedom and how do we, how do we play with that and how do we then still enable our kids to feel like this is super exciting? Yeah, I'll just add that I actually think it's really helpful taking cues from my own children um, and maybe it's different with very small children, but um, they are so excited for mm -hmm. Passover. My little two-year-old, he keeps like setting up a table and saying he's having a Seder party. And, and my five-year-old is like, I'm so excited for Passover. And I, I asked her like, what are you so excited about? Um, and she's like, cause we get so stuffed. It's so silly. We eat so much. <laughs> um, and he's, like, he's a kid who likes silly, which is awesome. <laughs> he's a kid who like, who holds joy, which is something I think also like, Pesach is a holiday that's about right reflecting on our pain, but holding our joy in a really real way. And she's somebody who like just and you know feels joy and emits joy, right? <sighs> yeah. So I think um, as usual, like kids can be our best teachers on on this, on how Passover is still so special this year, even when it's so different. Really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Lori, do you want to share? Well, this conversation about who are we used to having Passover with brings me to the question of Elijah and Elijah's presence uh, at the Seder. So uh, this is this is a, a moment we're fast forwarding right towards the end of the Seder. 
Um, and Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi, his cup comes basically as the fifth cup. We think there's four cups and four children and four questions, but we actually have a, a secret fifth cup. Um, and we open the door and we sing this famous song that mm -hmm. is also sung at, at Havdalah at the end of Shabbat. And we see if Elijah the prophet can come visit our Seder. A little bit of background about this character. Um, he, he was a real prophet in the, tor in the Tanakh. Um, he was very unhappy with the level of observance of the Jews of his time. He didn't feel like they were holding on enough to the traditions, whether it was circumcision or, or their not Jewish enough names or just their general Shabbat activities. And he was just railing against them, fire and brimstone. In fact, so fire and brimstone that he goes up for his non-death. He goes up in this chariot of fire and the rabbis take that to to believe that he's kind of never died and he kind of roams the earth and um he can come to be comforted at a child's bris at a baby naming or a circumcision ceremony um to every seder to these different moments to the end of shabbat to say okay the jewish people are still holding on to their values they're still you know engaged in these rituals they're still teaching the next generation a really beautiful, famous line uh, from Malachi says that when Elijah comes, the the parents' hearts will turn towards the children and the children's hearts will turn towards the parents. So it's actually this moment of ultimate teshuva, right? It's like this Yom Kippur reconciliation that we have at the end of the Seder. And um, Amanda, your your kids sound lovely, right? And, and we're also stuck at home with with these little people who have a lot of different needs that not every parent can meet every need of every child in every moment, right? There were teachers, there were playmates, there were a lot of helpers in their life. But so I'm holding on to that goal of um, turning towards each other by the end of the Seder and also saying, mm -hmm. what does it mean to open the door? How can we visit? Maybe we can count the doors in our house to start with and think about who comes in and out of them. Um, maybe we can open our, our phones and our Zooms and our text messages and visit with people who might not otherwise um, be on the top of our list. And so I think we can bring this idea of visiting each other and have Elijah be comforted by the way we are reconnecting this Passover. Mm. It's really beautiful. I actually was thinking about this this morning. Um, I spoke a little bit about during our morning service about Elijah and I was thinking about the idea that like, as a kid, this was like the scariest part of the Seder for me. I mean, I don't know, do you guys remember like going to the door and I remember being in Watertown, New York at my grandparents' house and like going to the door and I never wanted to do it alone. I always wanted like one of my cousins to come with me or my brother and, um, cause you know, maybe Elijah was there. And then, <laughs> what would happen and what would I do, right? Even though we really wanted Elijah to come, but that notion of like opening the door for Elijah and that idea that um, like, if we really believe that Elijah's presence could be felt at our Seder, certainly Elijah wouldn't need the door open for him. Um, mm -hmm. But we need to open that door, right? And that fits in with what you're saying, Lori. Like that's actually, that's something that we need to do. Like we need to be active in bringing on whatever kind of redemption we imagine is possible. And we also um, need to think about what it means to consistently open doors, which are so symbolic in our lives with the blood on the door and the mezuzah on the door and you know, doorways being such a, a, an important piece of what it means to be Jewish. Anybody else have any thoughts around about that? And Carrie's unmuting herself. Well, I was thinking about how uh, right now um, we're retreated behind our doors, right? I, I don't think I've gone anywhere in a week. <laughs> so, like, you know, uh, you know, I went to the grocery store a week ago Sunday to get milk and I, that was it. And so right now this idea of opening doors and, op and opening our heart and our minds and our souls to possibility is really scary. And here it is, the Seder again, asking us to do this, you know, in our moment of vulnerability, it's asking us to be open and to let it, let God in, let redemption in, let, you know, possibilities in. And that's kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. I want to show you two pictures here from Noam Sion's Haggadah. So, the, this family is all ready to uh, 
to go in and out of a door and bring bring Passover to life, right? And yet we also have this situation, right? Where we have somebody on the outside looking in at, at the privileged person who's basically reading about leaving Egypt and then the person who's not have resources is behind that window. It, it reminded me also, there was a picture on social media of a, a dad who was a doctor playing like tic-tac-toe with window uh, paint with his toddler outside his own door. And so the question of access and isolation and quarantine, mm -hmm. right, is also very real of um, allowing our, the doors to open anywhere we can and also being gentle um, and maintaining a connection when it looks, when it looks different. And I'm also thinking about this around the idea of opening the door and saying, you know, let all who are hungry come and eat, right? Like I right. remember that as such a, as a child, as such a key time too. And the notion that like we can go open our door at the beginning of our Seder, but the reality is it's, it's fake, you know? Any other year, did we really expect someone to be at the door? Probably not. But I do remember being in Jerusalem and the idea that like somebody could be at your door, you know? Um, and, but this year it's actually like, you know, you can come and eat, but you have to sit like at the edge of my driveway and I'll bring you the food, right? Because we can't actually let you in. And I don't know, what does that mean? And what's the, the relevance of that? And how do we make it still meaningful? Like, how do we still, I mean, I'm working on this a lot, this notion of what does it mean to physically distance, but to actually still remain socially connected and to remain spiritually uplifted. And to know that that physical distancing does not mean that we're not welcoming. It actually means that we have to go that extra effort to be welcoming and engaging. Yeah, I'm also, I also really have on my mind that um, this year in particular, um, it feels like there are so many more who are who may potentially be hungry, who may need food to eat. Um, and so uh, how can we, for those of us who have access, even if it's limited, like how can we give more than usual? Um, whether that's like physically making a donation, taking food to a food pantry or making a donation online of like, how can we embody that act of ensuring people who who are hungry and looking for food have have food to eat? Um, yeah. Another thing that came to mind when you were talking about Elijah, well, two things. Um, I think it's really, really profound that Elijah is, um, is invited not only to every Seder, but also to every to every bris, as you mentioned, which, um, you know, as as a mom who um, invited him to her son's bris, like there was something there was something very comforting to me about that idea. Um, and uh, in this time that feels kind of scary, I think it's really powerful that we're all inviting Elijah in for this for our satyrs, whether it's one night or two, and um, that this sort of like mythical comforting creature is is gonna visit all of us when none of us can physically be together. Um, and then the other thing I'm thinking about is my kids love this book that I think is called Not Yet Elijah. And it, um, it has mm -hmm. Elijah waiting outside the entire satyr and the refrain is like, Elijah, please not yet. Um, and I, I think this story just tells a lot about like patience and how hard it is to be patient. Um, and I think that's something very real right now that we're all needing to be very patient. We have no idea how long this situation is, is going to last. Um, and, and just trying to have as much patience as we can and digging really deep into that well of patience right now is so important. Amanda, that's such a wonderful word to bring in patience. Uh, one of the Haggadahs, I think it was Arye Ben David, noted that Moses's name is not mentioned in this whole Haggadah, right? We talked at the beginning about the Torah story and the Haggadah and the rabbi's version. And, and Elijah becomes this household name, right? This character of comfort that we know we're going to have a connection mm -hmm. with. 
And yet Moses, who's uh, both infinitely patient and extremely impatient, uh, who leads us through that experience is no longer the primary uh, protagonist. So I'm curious what you all think of, of that contrast. I love that idea that Moses is incredibly patient yet infinitely impatient because I think that in some ways that's actually like the inspiration for all of us in this world and in the work that we do, right? On one hand, patience is really an incredible value and we need to be patient and um, we need to be patient with people and we need to be comforting and, um, and compassionate and um, understand that things don't happen overnight. And on the other hand, if we're not like radically impatient, nothing will ever get done. And so like we actually have to always feel like there's fire under us and we're always moving forward and we have the impatience that will move us to make our world better and make better and make our communities better and um, make, you know, make this world what we dream it to be, as we often say. And that doesn't happen if we're too patient. So I just kind of love that idea that like you can be both patient and impatient and be the same, and that can be in one person. I'm like imagine that right well, now for Well, that embodies you. You know, we, we were ordained uh, almost 11 years ago and we've founded a minion together. I've watched you in, I think three different, three or four different communities. I'm, as you were saying this, I'm imagining uh, the, the videos of you in front of the ICE, um, you know, protest doing mincha and always making sure that that fire for prophetic leadership is there, and yet your pastoral presence is so patient. So, you, you're our, you're our Moses. Thank you for your leadership. I would not go that far at all, but that's very kind. But my point is, is like right. We we look at these biblical characters as um, as examples of of having different qualities that we want to embody in our lives. And um, I don't know that I've ever thought of Moses in that in those ways, right? At both patient and impatient. So. Um, and I think we look at all of, you know, all of, um, you know, all of our patriarchs and matriarchs in, in ways of looking at them as radically imperfect. And that's why we can identify with them because none of, they're deeply imperfect, yet they're also, um, they also created magic in the world. And so how can we sort of touch on each of, uh, on the good characteristics that they had and try to, try to make them manifest today? And I like that idea a lot about Moses. Elijah too. You go back to uh, to the Tanakh, to the Jewish Bible. The stories are not very appealing, right? It's only who he's become in our collective myth that he becomes this this comforting purveyor mm -hmm. of connection to the past. Hmm. Lori, you had another topic too, yeah, that you wanted to talk about. Another piece from the Haggadah. You'll have to remind me. What were we? I'm not sure if I remember either. I think it's something about matzah as both bread of affliction, the symbol of matzah. Yeah. Okay. So we're going back to the chametz and um, chametz and matzah contrast. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Thank okay. you. Okay. So we're sort of looping, looping in big circles, right? The matzah is, is still a little bit there at the end, but if we go back to where Amanda started about this idea of the biur chametz, the releasing it, the burning it up. Um, chametz itself uh, is not just bread. It's any of the five grains that have mixed with water for at least 18 minutes. And that is how, at least rabbinically, maybe not according to Julia Child, uh, the, the yeast and the process of rising starts, right? So those are the five grains that we, that we don't eat or get any uh, benefit from over the holiday. Um, and this idea of lahachmit, to turn chametz into the verb, which means to rise or to get yeasty, lahachmit, the Hasidic masters really understand the Sfadama in particular, but many, as the puffing of our own ego, the inflation of our sense of self, um, the the hot and puffy hot air that we bring to our egocentric view of the world. And as we get to and through viewer chametz, um, as we start to look for it before we burn it, we have to look with a flashlight or a candle. We're looking at all our corners. We vacuum. We're seen under the couch pillows. We actually have to do it in our own life and our own heart as well. 
where is the chametz? Where is the ego uh, in our in our world, in our world view? And of course, quarantine 2020 is the ultimate ego eradicator. I think we're all realizing our our matzah quality, right? That sense of just just the basics. What are our essentials? Just the water and the flour, right? And get it on and get it quick. Get in and out of that store for that milk, right, Amanda? I, I, or it was Carrie who said, going just for the milk, get in and out. That's a matzah moment, I think. So I, I wonder for each of us um, and for everyone who's in our wider community here, what does it mean to come into a posture of matzah, to be this matzah who mm -hmm. is not full of ourselves, that our needs are more than others, that our contributions are more than others, that our hot air is, uh, is more beautiful than others. Um, that's that that contrast that we slowly, slowly get rid of. So how are each of you dealing with uh, humility and getting into a matzah mentality? I'm sorry, maybe I'm meeting myself. All of you are mothers. I think that most of you, you probably have a really good sense of humility and being matzah because what even with teenagers, I I can't fix it for them. I can't make eighth grade culmination come back. My daughter's just not going to get it this year. And that is really hard, right? That puts you in the moment when you are no longer the one who can fix the boo-boo and make it better, you know? And I think that's very humbling on the one hand and also very much part of what we're doing now. So. That's what I was thinking. Really cool. So I like to think of, um, you know, it's about a half a year since Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. So there's the connection that we do this sort of chuva work and this sort of emptying out of ourselves and, you know, going through all the things that we did wrong when we throw our bread in the water. Mm. And then about a half a year later, it's like we're doing it again, sort of, um, or we have this opportunity to do it again. And I think that that's what that beautiful spot I'm at teaching suggests for us that like, actually in this last handful of months, you know, we got ourselves down so that we were like matzah and we were humble at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We threw all of our bread in the water and now we have expanded again and now we have to do it again at Pesach. And um, it's something that we maybe don't think about so often, that this is a, a piece of the Pesach story, but it is a piece of the Pesach story. And part of that symbolism of, of the sort of bread of, a, of our affliction and also the bread of our freedom. And, you know, this bread, has, uh, this particular matzah bread has such deep symbolism on so many levels. It's so interesting what you just said because it makes me think of Tzim Tzim for the creation of the world, right? Like God expanded and shrank and expanded and shrank and expanded mm -hmm. and shrank in order to create space in the world for creation and what is newer, space in the universe for what is new. And it's like, as individual human beings and as a community, we expand and we have now we have to shrink. Um, we put out in the world and now it's time to like shrink and see what happens. And in order for there to be creativity and for the order there to be growth, you have to go through this process. And it's perfect for spring, right? Mm -hmm. If we're gonna bloom, we need to make space for that bloom. Mm. Right, that's that's great. So making space for ourselves to bloom means stepping back. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, love, I love this idea so much that you um, put out there of, of how are we matzah. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts about it, but one thing I'll share is, um, so in uh, in Colorado, Governor Polis um, is encouraging, this just came out yesterday, but he's encouraging everyone whenever they're outside of their homes to wear uh, a homemade mask. Um, and so today when I when I walked my dog, I wore one. It, it's the first time I've worn one um, really for an extended period of time. And um, it was just such a shift in how I normally behave in the world. Um, and I, I saw two other people wearing masks when I was walking, but I saw a lot of people who weren't. And I also could feel them staring at me. Um, and 
it was really a, a humbling moment of like going out and looking very different in the world. And I imagine next week, I'll probably see a lot more people in masks than I do now. Um, but it really was a moment of like, yeah, I felt very insecure. And also I really felt like it was a matzah moment of, of I was kind of contracting my own ego for the sake of, of the better good. And um, for the sake of, of being a role model and doing what our governor, a role model, is is asking that we do right now. Mm. That story gave me chills. <laughs> mm. Wow. So I was actually gonna, in my um, thinking about two sort of highlights of this holiday for me, I was gonna touch on um, some of what you just touched on, Lori. It really ties in nicely, the idea of the search for hummates. And, um, so when I was in rabbinical school, I was in um, a class where we were looking at the Shulchan Aruch. And um, it says very specifically that in the depth of night, you should take your tiny little candle and search in the crevices of your house for your last pieces of hummates. And I think this fits in so, so beautifully with what you were saying, Lori. Um, what touches me so deeply about this is that it's not saying bring a big torch. And it's not saying do it in like the sparkling light of day. It's like do it in the depth of the night and take a candle, a candle, like a very gentle, tiny flame and search in the smallest parts. And so it's 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 a similar idea to this, this notion that this hametz is symbolic. The, the hametz isn't just bread that's left over. This is the, the swollen pieces of us. And so if we do that in the broad light of day, or if we do that with a big wide torch, that can be damn scary. Um, because everybody's watching and because we're shining a huge, huge light in on the things that we might be least proud of. Our insecurities, um, the places where we feel our own deepest pain, uh, maybe the spaces where we have caused other people incredibly deep pain. And if we really wanna look for those spots, we can't do it with a big torch. We actually need to allow ourselves to do it with a very small, gentle candle. And so I think that this search that we do, even with our children, the fact that it's a thing, like we set out the, the bread and the kids search for it, that there's something um, symbolic and educational and beautiful for our kids. Because in some ways, you know, whether we're saying it literally or not, the metaphor is there that we're saying to them, here's a gentle candle. And yeah, we all have parts of ourselves for which we don't feel proud and parts of ourselves we might even feel shame and parts of ourselves that we might wanna bury. But here's a gentle candle and take it and, and look in those spaces and bring those pieces of yourself out because you're never gonna be thrown out the door. That door is always gonna be open wide for you. And you're always going to be loved in this house, no matter what you did, no matter how much of a big mistake you made, no matter what you said that we are like shocked by or disgusted by. It doesn't matter, we're you and we love you and we appreciate you and we value you and you're a part of us. And take that gentle flame and find those pieces of yourself and bring them out and it's really gonna be okay. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing I just wanted to tie it to was the idea of yachats in the in the Seder where we break the middle matzah. And then the the larger piece of the matzah becomes the um, afikomen. And the smallest piece of matzah is is the, the, the smallest half is the really the, the piece of matzah that we do the entire Seder on. And when we finally eat that matzah, we eat it plain. We don't eat it with anything on it. The first one, when we say a moti lacha min ha'aretz, and when we say the, the breath blessing of Ramata, we eat it plain. And this is in such deep contrast to how we're eating bread throughout the rest of the year. I think that the question, I'm curious if you guys um, would agree with this, but I think that one of the questions that rabbis get the very most is why do we put salt on the challah? And um, one of the reasons we put salt on the challah is because poor person's bread is bread that's eaten plain. And so we need to eat our challah with something that gives it taste. It's a symbol of our riches. Yet on Pesach, we eat it plain because we are poor people, right? On one hand, 
this year we are slaves and we say that like this year we were we are slaves may we be free next year on the other hand we're free people eating at our table and we're leaning as you were talking about amanda and so it's this constant conflict of both like challenge and inspiration all in one meal and in at, at, you know at this moment of yachats at this break we are breaking our own hearts on some level by breaking this matzah without when we break bread, right, for motzi, we say a bracha and we break bread. This time there's no blessing. We're simply breaking this matzah. And in some way, I think our, our rabbis thought of this as like a heartbreak. We're breaking our own hearts because it's only when we actually have that heartbreak that we can really let everything else in. It's like the heartbreak makes space. Um, and this ties into what you were saying too. The heartbreak makes space for all that is possible and all that can become. Um, so that, that, that small piece of matzah, um, you know, has this power to symbolize so much and has this power to enable us to be both brokenhearted and broken and also come out of the Seder feeling a little bit more whole. And I think this year in particular, where there's so much that we really do feel brokenhearted about and we're going to be holding at our Seder, and we're also going to find spaces and find opportunities to connect and be whole as well. And uh, maybe that's the challenge particularly for this year. I don't know if any of you guys have responses to that or thoughts. Well, that's beautiful. And it's also a secret Moses message. I, in the last few years, have learned this beautiful teaching that actually Moses is, contrary to what I said before, in the Haggadah, in the Seder, I should say, not in the Haggadah. So if you think about the three matzahs, Kohen, Levi, Israel, right? The middle matzah, which is the Yachatz, is Levi. And we know that Moses is from the tribe of Levi, from Amran, the, Amran, the, son, Amran, the son of Levi. So Moses is first broken, taken away from his home, put in this little paper uh, teva, sent away out of the community, out of the dining room, as it were. Uh, and then we go through this whole communal experience. And yet we really can't get out of Egypt without him and his leadership. And so it's the children, right? Going back to Elijah, turning the hearts of the children towards the parents and parents towards the children. We are dependent on the next generation to find Moses, bring him back to us. We cannot conclude this without the Afikomen. The last act mm. of the Seder is to restore Moses and to restore all leadership, all leadership and all leaders mm -hmm. to the role that they are meant to play in our society and our, our redemption, whether that's a congregational rabbi up to the highest office. We must have uh, the reunification of the leader with the community at the Seder. Mm. That's really great. So in my in my household growing up, I uh, the, so the so basically the afikoman was created in a napkin, right? And then the parents would actually so the parents would sort of like put it underneath something, and then the kids would steal it, and the kids would hide it, and then the parents would be like, "Oh, we want to in the seder, we have to look for it," and the parents would look all over and would never be able to find it, and then the kids would bring it out and there'd be bartering, which is I think possibly the original way of doing this. But it's always been, it's now been transformed. So I'm imagining that in your households, you grew up with the parents hiding it and the kids finding it, because I think that that's more, more normative. Is that the case for you guys? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is what we do, but we're at, I'm going to be leading a virtual theater for Judaism your way. And we're going back to the original model in terms of, I think it's easier with the virtual theater of having the kids try and nab the Afi come in and hide it during the theater. So you're, 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 wait, you're, but at your house, the parents hide it, and the, wait, your house, oh, you're going back to the model that I grew up with. The kids grab it, hide it, and then the parents can't find it. Interesting. Like this virtual Seder, yeah. But in, in my home, actually, what we do is um, we actually break it at a, for each kid that's at the Seder, we break the afikomen additionally, and each kid has their own afikomen to find. Um, which this year I won't have to break it as many times as I usually do. <laughs> I was just thinking about like what Lori was saying and this sort of um, like the, the necessity for leadership and how that comes with the reunification at the end of the Seder and this idea that kids are like incredibly involved in that. 
and the idea that we need those voices of young people in our society today. And that, and you know, when we think about any leadership, that these kids are the these kids are the face of the leadership of the future, and that. We we've been saying, I mean, in the political sphere, right, often that um, that it's going to really take these children's voices to um, be very loud about things like gun safety, about things like um, gun control, about climate, about any number of things that are really dear to their hearts um, to be active and engaged in. You know, it just made me think of that because the kids are so involved, like that's such a kid piece of the Seder. Yeah. I, I, when you were speaking, Lori, what it made me think of was yesterday, um, I had my first experience leading a, a virtual Shabbat thing. Um, and, um, you know, I, I had everyone mute themselves because it, it's so hard to sing together over, over Zoom. Um, and it hadn't, it, it hadn't like viscerally occurred to me how much strength I get as a leader from hearing everyone else. And, um, and, and it was just such a strange experience just hearing my own voice. Like I could see them participating and, and I got something out of that, but there really is so much koach you get as a leader from everyone else. Um, and, and I, I just think it speaks so much to what you're saying that like, yes, we need to establish a leader, but we can't do that without an entire community bringing their voices too. Mm -hmm. Moses, oh so, wait, say that again, Lori. Just Moses needs that so much as we need him. So I think um, I, I, that resonates with me so much, Amanda, because we've been doing all of these virtual services and it's so, it's just so odd to um, have one voice at a time in a space where, you know, everyone who's at RODEF or at any shul before RODEF who knows me, I'm the person or the rabbi that's always like, move in closer, let's rope off the back rows, move in closer, we need to feel each other's presence, we need to feel each other's presence. And this is like the total opposite of that. It's like, you know, we're as far away from each other as we can be. And, you know, my, um, I, I've learned over the years that my spirituality does not come from being in a beautiful space. Quite the opposite. It could be, it, the, the space could be absolutely nothing. Um, what creates a space for me is the acoustics and the feeling of song around me and hearing the voices, like really literally hearing the energy and feeling the energy that I get from being close to people. And now we're so far um, it's it, 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 like it's a painful reality how that distance feels. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. And it's going to be interesting to see how we come back, right? And I think that that's one of the sort of fears that we hold now. And I think it's it's okay and important to name those fears. Like when we come back together, what does that look like? And how does that look? And how quickly will we be able to be close to one another? And, um, and what, what will that feel like? And, and um, and when will that be safe? Um, because being far is really hard. So I don't know if, do, do you guys have a last word? I think that that would be really wonderful. And then we're gonna move into a prayer component of our afternoon and we'll do a little bit of davening together. Do you have a last, last thought? And the word that comes up for me, Rahel, is just permission, just if we can each give ourselves permission, looping back to Amanda's opening thought with the formula of burning the hummets, that it is what it is, mm -hmm. as we say in Hebrew. And whether it's, it's okay to not have 40 people on eight different breakout rooms on your Zoom trying to get everyone at the perfect camera angle. If your kids are burned out on screens, it's okay to just let it be the two, three, four of you. It's okay to connect more deeply. It's okay to wrestle. It's okay to go to the Torah text in the Haggadah or vice versa. It's okay to, you know, have your meals not be uh, as extravagant. Um, we're, we're all, and that's the beauty of the situation as we are all literally, the world is in this together. And so, um, I, I think that the intimacy that of being with all of you and being with the community um, and being so close, right? We, we have gained something tremendous. And I do feel that we are walking through the sea together closely, right? On our screens. 
uh, we, we will stand together at Sinai eventually in seven, you know, seven and a half weeks. Um, and I hope that we can give permission to just accept, uh, as one of my teachers says, accept the what is rather than focusing on the what if. Thank you. Yeah, I think what I'm taking with me, um, I really, I really loved this idea of Moses as both like very patient and very impatient. Um, and I think that's certainly something I've been experiencing um, recently. And when I've been in those moments of impatience, I've been really hard on myself. And I think it's very helpful to me to think about, oh, it's okay. In my impatient moment, I'm having a Moses moment too. Um, and, and in my moments where I'm able to dig deep into the patient's well, that like, Tom said, that's also a Moses moment and that's okay too. Mm, I love that. It's actually okay. Sometimes it's actually good to be impatient, right? Like sometimes it's good to be patient, but sometimes it's actually good to be impatient, but right. Both are very human. Mm. Uh oh, we can't hear you. I'm thinking with me, one of the last things you said, I think, from this is um, uh, we need Moses as much as Moses needs us. I think Gloria said it, but from your teaching, our leadership, all of us are in leadership roles, and, and our leaders in general, I think they need us as much as we need them right now. Um, and that's the first thing that I'm thinking about now that we've had this discussion. And the second thing that I always say to people, and I think about Passover all the time, is just enjoy it you know mm. if you spend too much time getting bogged down in the details you miss you miss the point <laughs> so yeah. enjoy it mm. that's really nice so we began with just a statement about what rabbis um, often are known to do and that is speak um on shabbat hagadol and it was usually a fiery sermon that was really focused on the kashrut of passover to make sure that people had some fear um and we hope that we're leaving um, any of you, all of you, with not a sense of fear, um, but rather a sense of excitement and a sense of calm and a sense of um, compassion for yourself and a sense of understanding and a sense of an opportunity for questioning. And also maybe we'll go back to that idea, a sense of patience and a sense of impatience and holding all of that um, and knowing that we all wish you uh, really wonderful Passover. And this will be a pace off like no other, certainly. Um, and whether, as Lori said, you are on Zoom because that is exactly where you need to be on Erev Pesach, or whether you are simply in your home with immediate family members, either way is just fine and beautiful. And may we all have the ability to make Pesach come to life in new ways and also some old ways this year making it meaningful, resonant, and joyful. Sameach. Sameach. Well, we're going to do a little bit of davening. Um, we'll begin with a nagoon that we actually uh, had planned to begin this session with, but I sort of flew into the conversation instead. Um, and then we'll move to Ashray, uh, a chant on page 226. is on page 226. So Ashrei begins with um, a line that seems so fitting right now. It says, praised are those who dwell in your home, which 
all of us are spending so much time in our homes right now. Um, and Osray goes on, it's an acrostic, so it has a line capturing basically the entirety of, of the Hebrew alphabet of um, gratitude. So as we move into, um, well, I'll just start with, with the beginning of Ashray, um, and and then we'll have some silence. But as we move into that, I just invite you to hold into your heart um, some things that you're feeling grateful for right now in, in your own homes. Um, even though we're, yeah. we're facing so many challenges, um, we also still have so much to be grateful for. Tehillat Adonai Yedabehi Vayavara Kolbasa Shem Kodra Lelamba Anachnu Nevarichya Mehata now Lori will uh, lead us in a chant, um, a chant as we move deeper into our prayers. So Mincha is unusual a bit in terms of Shabbat Mincha, the structure of, of various services because the Torah reading comes so quickly as we dive into the next Parsha. Um, and so this chant would be, or this song, these words would be said if we were going around one of our sanctuaries and uh, stopping and, and giving respect to the Torah. Rameinu Adonai Eloheinu Yishtachavu Lahadom Raglav Kadosh Hu. So we can just imagine our favorite Torah scroll, the most beautiful uh, uh, decoration on the one that we're connected to and the space we're connected to. Maybe you're imagining where you stand in a certain aisle. Maybe you're not uh, a shul goer and maybe uh, the Torah is not an object that resonates, but rather the stories and the wisdom of our tradition. Either way, we lift ourselves up to be in relationship with our tradition and with the text and the sacred, the sacred scroll. This melody is from my friend Brian Schachter Brooks. Ramemu, Ramemu, Adonai Eloheinu, Vishtachavu, Vishtachavu, Ladom Raglav, Kadoshu.
offering prayers for healing is such a central piece of what we are doing in these days. And so we invite Carrie to offer a prayer for healing for those who are sick, as well as a prayer for all of our healthcare workers. Dear God, be with my family and friends, bring peace to their troubled spirits, enable them to know that their love gives me strength. Help me to express my gratitude and appreciation to them for all that they have done and are continuing to do. Let them feel free to bring me their own joys and sorrows that I may continue to participate in their lives, even as they are in mine. May this also be a time for inner searching that I may appreciate more fully the good and beautiful in life and labor to bring these lives and the lives of others. Grant me health and healing that I may carry out your peace. Then will my life reflect your presence and my love, your love. Baruch Ata Adonai, Rofei HaCholim. We praise you, O oh God, healer of the sick. Mm. We'll offer now a guided meditation. If you would like to dive in the traditional Amidah, we invite you to do so as well. Uh, but Laura will lead us in a, in a meditation as we move deeper into our prayers. So often uh, we stand for the Amidah, it is La Amod, the standing prayer. I'm going to stay seated and probably we will here on screen because we've perfectly adjusted uh, the cameras, but I invite you to stand if you like. If you want to stay seated, that's fine. Let's start from the bottom of our feet, maybe spreading your toes, becoming aware of your arches, your inner arches. Take your ankle bones and send them out externally away from your middle and wiggle your toes once more and place them back down. Your first deep breath. And imagine energy, chiyut, chi, prana coming up your body through your middle. If you're still sitting like I am, perhaps you feel your tailbone if you're standing, you notice your pelvis centered over your hips. And move that deep breath into the belly. Notice the belly is connected to what's above and below it. Allow the breath to expand out the low ribs. Pressing the back, the spine and vertebrae away from your belly button. <sighs> really seen that. Bring your breath, even a hand if you want, one on your belly and another on your heart. Find a connection between your tummy, your belly, and your heart. If you've had what we call as parents big feelings during this period, you can Notice if they're coming from your chest or the pit of your stomach. And by connecting these regions, bringing a flow, an echad back, we can let some of the tension go. As you move up into your heart, imagine the back of your heart. Imagine softening your Pharaoh's heart releasing that heart of stone and melting it with your breath. The lungs, the back, the shoulder blades open up. We remember we have shoulders. We remember to stop looking into our screen with our shoulders and our chin and our neck. Breathe into your back, your shoulders, lengthen your neck. Allow the ears to draw a circle, the chin to draw a circle. Releasing your jaw, rubbing your jaw. If you're off screen, you can actually take a finger to the inside of your mouth and work the, the actual jaw muscles. And remember those wiggled toes and those spread ankle bones. As you begin to breathe, imagine yourself as a channel, a flute, a bamboo, maybe a reed from the sea of reeds coming all the way up with air. 
from toes up the legs to that belly, the heart, the back of the heart, the shoulders. <sighs> and just melt that all away as an Amida. And finally, on your next breath in, come into the throat where we speak from, where we cry, we connect and laugh from, and allow the breath to come through the throat into the sinus cavity. Imagining all the breath in the world, the Ruach Elohim coming in between your ears and letting everything go and melt. And finally to the crown, the Keter, your tefillin point or your kippah area or your hat. Imagining one breath of God coming in from your toes to the top of your head all the way up. And as you release your breath through your nose or through your mouth or with a sigh, we come to that idea in the Amidah of Echad. We have unified on Shabbat our spirits, our hearts, our prayers. And now all these parts of our body to come together into the calm of the afternoon. Imagine your own body scan maybe three more times as we finish this guided prayer. Oh, say shalom in Roma. Huya say shalom aleinu. Ve'al kol Yisrael, ve'al kol Yoshe Tovel, ve'imru, ve'imru, amen. Find some part of your body that wasn't singing to sing with. Oh, say shalom in Ramah. Who ya se shalom aleinu, they all call Yisrael, they all call Yoshvei Tevel, ve'imru, ve'imru, amen. Thank you, Nava Tehillah, for this amazing melody that we all love. Malinu Shabbat Adon Hakol Ateke Dula Leotzeh Rishit Shalom Asanu Kigeh Haratzot Velo Samanu Kmishpachot Atama Shalom Sam Chalkinu Kahem Vekor Aleinu Kechol Hamonam Vanachnu Korim Umishtachavim Umodim Lipne melech, malche amlachim, hakadosh barachu. The Elohim, who Elohim, 
Mourner's Kaddish is on page 249. We invite all those who are remembering a loved one to say Mourner's Kaddish along with me. The responses for Mourner's Kaddish, I like to think of them as a virtual hug. It's like when we want to say to somebody, I'm here for you, I'm supporting you, I'm hugging you, and now we literally cannot hug. But we can say these lines as a means of support. We pray for a time when all of our hearts are united, when all of our hearts, broken hearts and whole hearts, when all of our hearts are able to be together and to hold up all those who are mourning and all those who are hurting. Yitgadal v'yitgadash shemei rabba v'yalma divrach yurtei v'yamlich malchutei v'chayachon v'yamechon v'chayed kol beit Yisrael v'agala v'izman kariv v'imru amen yehe shemei rabba mavorach le'olam omei omaya v'yitbarach v'yishtabach v'yibar v'yitrumam v'yitnaseh V'yitadar, v'yitale, v'yitalal, sh'mei t'kudasha b'richu, v'yilam in kol b'irchata v'shirata, t'ushbechata v'nechemata, d'amiran b'yalma v'yimru, amen. Yehei shlama rabba min sh'maya, v'chayim alenu v'yal kol Yisrael v'yimru, amen. Ose shalom b'yimramav, hu ya'ase shalom, alenu v'yal kol Yisrael v'yimru, amen. Thank you all so much. Thank you. It was so good Thank to be you. with you this, morning, this afternoon. It's so good to be able to spend this, some of the Shabbat with you. And um, may we all have a really sweet Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. P.S. about. Let's give a, a P.S. that the nigun, the melody we just sang, is actually the words are Ozi Vizimrat Ya Adonai Lili Shua, which is from the song sung. When we cross the sea, when we get to the other side of the sea, the same source text as Micha Mocha for the shulgoers out there. And so this really is a blessing. And I think and we chose this so that we could see each other on the on the other side of the mine, going through the narrows and getting to the expanse so we could sing hand in hand. Great. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, shalom, everybody. Bye. Bye, shalom.